Good morning and uh, welcome to the session organized by the British International Research Institutes. Um, I'm Charles Tripp, uh, Vice President of the British Academy with responsibility for the British International Research Institutes. And I'm very happy to be chairing this session organized by four of the eight institutes linked to the British Academy. Um, the eight British International Research Institutes are long established and vitally important parts of the UK's research infrastructure and the arts in the humanities and in the social sciences. They play a key role both uh, in the work of UK-based researchers, but also, of course, in the collaboration with researchers from the regions in which they're based. And these stretch from Italy and Greece uh, to the Black Sea, Central Asia, across Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and the Middle East, to North and to East Africa. Uh, since the 19th century, and the British School at Athens is the oldest of them, founded in 1886, they have accumulated extraordinary unparalleled archives that reflect the work carried out through them and with them, and the changing disciplines in the humanities and the social sciences uh, during that period, with great emphasis on all aspects of archaeology in the first decades of their existence, but gradually accumulating resources uh, linked to ethnography, to geography, urban studies, art history, botany, natural resource management, and sociology. So given the richness of their archives, the case for digitizing these, both for conservation purposes, but also uh, to make them more widely known is very strong. And some of them have been undertaking this for a number of years. But as they proceeded, they realized that collaboration and coordination between them would yield even more significant results, providing links between different fields of knowledge and the work carried out in different places by some extraordinarily distinguished British scholars. And these are just some of the scholars whose work, uh, whose names are known and whose work connects with the regions in which the uh, British International Research Institutes work. And as you can see, a number of them worked in different areas, now all in some senses linked to the British International Research Institute. So it's an important to suggest that these are links uh, that will be more enriched by the working together and by making aware, making people aware of the archives that link them together. However, the practical and technical uh, challenges of coordination on this scale are formidable. And in telling you of their work today, my colleagues from the British International Research Institutes would greatly value any feedback from those present who have been grappling with similar challenges and may indeed have overcome them. However, Without further ado, therefore, I'd like to introduce my four colleagues who will be making the presentations today. Uh, the first to speak will be John Bennett, who's the director of the British School at Athens, be followed by Alessandra Jovenko, archivist at the British School at Rome, uh, followed by Nurdan Atalan Cherezmez, uh, digital repository manager at the British Institute at Ankara, and finally, Charlotte Rocher, uh, professor emerita of digital Hellenic studies at King's College and uh, very closely connected to the Society for Libyan Studies. Each of them will speak consecutively in that order, and we'll be happy to take questions and comments in the last 10, 15 minutes of this Welcome, session. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, in this session. As Charles mentioned, the BSA, uh, the British School at Athens, the BSA, as I'll refer to it from now on, uh, is the oldest of the BIRI, founded in 1886. It has a main base in central Athens with satellite research centres at Knossos on Crete, and like all the BIRI, it maintains a London office at the British Academy's premises uh, there in London. I'm presenting uh, as director as an indication of the importance which the BSA attaches to this programme of digitisation. But I emphasise that this is a team effort, largely carried out by uh, a team uh, who are listed on the slide. Uh, our assistant director, our archivist, who I know is joining this session and will be available in the Q&A afterward to shed more light. Um, our IT officer, a fixed term data manager and various volunteers. As an institute uh, founded in 1886, we've obviously accreted a very large internal archive comprising our corporate records and various excavation and fieldwork records. But we've also acquired personal papers, including those of George Finlay, a prominent 19th century Philhellenist, um, the Noel Baker family, a British family based in Greece uh, following independence, 
And the major acquisition uh, was the archives of the British, uh, the Byzantine Research Fund, uh, a unique collection of architectural drawings, photographs, and notebooks created in the late 19th to mid 20th century by a small team of British architects who were trained in the arts and crafts tradition. Another major collection is the Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies image collection. Over 7,000 items comprising their photographic collection collected between 1891 and 1967. And these comprise negatives, glass and film in a various variety of sizes, as well as photographic prints and glass lantern slides. Our collection management system uh, is uh, the uh, proprietary um, software EMU, uh, now owned by Axial. Um, it's an object oriented database with, which co covers documents, objects, images, etc. And it was purchased uh, just over 10 years ago in order to try to integrate as many of the BSA data types, but also as many of the processes, administrative and research processes that the BSA carries out. Data entry and cleanup are constantly uh, ongoing and the system runs uh, on site with regular backups. And just to give you a, an indication of the size of what's already in uh, EMU, we have an e-catalog comprising over 150,000 records, parties of 17,500, sites of 5,700, uh, and multimedia running to 183,000. Um, and there are, of course, various access restrictions protecting either material that is, is sensitive or, of course, records that relate to individuals, individual staff. Um, plans to make the collection accessible when digitized were initiated several years ago, in fact, pioneered uh, on the Byzantine Research Fund, as well as digitization of the catalogue of our large archaeological collection uh, at Knossos. But they were realized uh, in 2019 with the launch of our portal Digital Collections, which offers a bespoke interface to the EMU data. And this was significantly expanded during the lockdowns, partly because of a diversion of effort from uh, things that could not be carried out during lockdown, but also as a service, since of course lockdown pro prohibited travel for many people to come and access them on site. Each new collection, when it's mounted, is accompanied by a short blogs post, which we call Archive Stories, and this draws out an aspect uh, of, the, of the collection. Uh, there have been multiple uh, posts uh, on the Society for Promotion of Hellenic Studies image collection, uh, on William Gell, on Keppel Craven and Petrie's notebooks, as well as on early excavation notebooks from the BSA. Now, I've just chosen to show uh, static examples, but um, I, I urge you to go and visit our website to, sit, to try the dynamic uh, interface that you have there. Taking the Byzantine Research Fund as an example, uh, we have three different uh, modes in which you can browse it. Uh, a grid mode, which you see in the top left, a list mode in the middle, and a map, which is obviously particularly useful uh, for coverage of particular sites uh, or particular regions. And taking the SPHS, the Society for Promotion of Hellenic Studies uh, archive as an example, we can see the map view here. Um, and it's possible to do a detailed search uh, on various terms. Here, a particular creator, a particular location, refined to a particular image number that I happen to know the number of. And that reveals this particular image, which as you'll note, uh, is in modern Turkey. And this is another point that uh, emphasizes Charles's point at the beginning of the, inter the overlap between our different archives in the Biri. Another example is Digital Mycenae, which we launched uh, in June 2020, close to the, anniversary, the centenary of the BSA excavation starting at that site. Uh, it's already been uh, shortlisted for an award in Apollo magazine, but an example of digital unification of archives archives that are physically located in separate places, Cambridge and Athens, but searchable uh, through uh, a single interface. Another potential that digitization offers for us is the opportunity to present a coherent selection of items or a narrative around a collection through virtual exhibitions. That is a guided approach, which contrasts with an open search uh, for information through the search feature. So one example here is a standalone exhibition on pure nature, which draws on the Byzantine Research Fund materials to highlight the interplay between Byzantine buildings and their environment, 
and also the use of nature and natural features in ornament. Uh, individual static pages here are linked directly through to items in, the, uh, in EMU through our digital collections platform. Similarly, using making full use of the digital collections platform, uh, a set of webcasts the BSA produced marking the 1821-2021 bicentenary uh, is available, uh, offers a series of short commentaries uh, on objects uh, marking uh, that particular uh, bicentenary. Now, the potential, obviously, for extending this uh, is very large, and I just give two uh, examples. In the top right, um, we recently found, received uh, funding for a three-year postdoc uh, fellowship uh, on modern Greek studies to study and oversee the digitization of a significant part of George Finley's papers. And this will join a very large body of digital material which is going online uh, in association with uh, the, uh, the bicentenary. And in the bottom left, um, of course, the potential for uh, unifying uh, a distributed archive. Here, the notebooks in particular of early, of early 19th century British traveler, Sir William Gell. These are widely distributed after his death and exist in the BSA, in the British School at Rome, in the British Museum, the, the, in Oxford uh, and Bristol, as well as other locations. And of course, digitization offers the potential to unite these virtually to inform study of travel, social history and other aspects. So in conclusion, I hope I've made, a clear, made clear, uh, uh, the rich content of the BSA collections and how we've begun to make those accessible, discoverable and useful, usable by uh, others. Um, digitization, of course, as Charles mentioned, preserves the often fragile, almost always unique original but also makes a unique resource available in multiple locations simultaneously. The Biri collections have great potential to inform the historiography of our disciplines, particularly archaeology, inform social history, especially around travel and reception, and of course studies to studies uh, of, of heritage, particularly on data site, data on particular sites or monuments no longer existence, for example, uh, the Byzantine monuments of Thessaloniki before the Great Fire of 1917. There are many overlaps among the BIRI, including in the SBHS image collection, so the potential for making collections accessible and discoverable to a wider audience, academic and otherwise, are considerable. Thanks very much for your attention. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alessandra Giovenco, and as Charles uh, has anticipated, I'm the archivist at the British School of Rome which is a British research institute for the humanities and the practice of the fine arts and architecture based in the Valle Giulia in Rome. It is a research gateway to Italy, Europe and the Commonwealth. The BSR has always been a creative, vibrant and transcultural community where there are no boundaries between disciplines. Interdisciplinarity is the driving force behind all our activities. Founded in 1901 as a school of archaeology, history and letters for the promotion of research in Italy and about Italy, it broadened its scope and mission by receiving a royal charter in 1912 and launching an ambition program of scholarships in the fine arts the following year. Since then, the BSR has evolved by adapting itself to numerous political, cultural and social changes and addressing the challenges of the present and the future. The BSR collections include a broad range of material. Sorry. <laughs> it gets, oh. Here I am. Okay, the BSR collections include a broad range of materials from rare books to paper records, photographic collections, museum objects, manuscript notebooks, postcards, engravings, and other objects created and accumulated over the course of the institution's multidisciplinary history. Many of these collections were bequeathed or donated by directors, assistant directors, staff members, and scholars. Others were purchased. I speak on behalf of a group of colleagues as the results we have achieved since 2002 in the digital domain are built on the expertise and knowledge of many, including the contribution of other short-term colleagues, interns, and IT developers. 
Each object, whether a photograph, map, or drawing, has been cataloged in Mark 21 on COHA, our open source information library system. This is the main database from which we are migrating our data. The archival resources are being cataloged through the archival software system currently in use, ArchivesSpace, and will provide information about our corporate records as well as excavation archaeology records. We are considering the export of metadata and description from this platform as well. Our records are also available through the Urbis catalog, a discovery tool providing coordinated access to the resources of 22 international research libraries in Rome with over 2 million records. Metadata exported from the library catalog are processed and migrated onto the BSR Digital Collections platform, which was launched in October 2020. It is the culmination of a long process began many years ago and from which we have learned much in terms of ways to achieve our objectives as they evolved. We had an old platform, but we felt we had to develop further and were able to do that thanks to the rapid developments in technology. The technical environment has changed so radically in the last few years that much can be done far more easily than before. The new web page includes a highlight section in which research projects, theme-based presentations, virtual exhibitions, and new digital content are presented and can be browsed in a more engaging manner. So um, why uh, Islandora? Islandora 7 has been identified for various reasons, one of which is that is an open source digital assets management system. Although requiring technical support, it ensures compliance with metadata and format standards, facilitates the management of complex bodies of digital material, and allows for the ingestion of various types of digital content, including audiovisual resources. More than 28,300 records are available for consultation from 10 collections belonging to two physical repositories, the Photographic Archive and the Library and Archive Special Collections. These are arranged according to their provenance. The digitization of the items in our collections has sometimes been run in-house, and one of our aims is to invest in staff development and build capacity. Hosting, server, and backups are run on-site. Access to the admin panel is provided through a front-end web interface. Our digital collections website has brought our unique historic collections to a global audience, providing access to our photographic archives, as well as a selection of maps, drawings, and engravings from our special collections. These can be browsed in various ways, not least through the faceted search, which shows up on the left-hand side of each results page, and which allow users to narrow down the results as you can see on the top left corner of the slide. Not everything has been scanned and made available. Some parts of collections or in a whole collections remain to be evaluated and assessed, primarily in the context of issues relating to copyright. And this you can see in the uh, image bottom right of the slide. Since the outset, we have considered high quality metadata as essential in terms of facilitating the research community. We are confident we can benefit enormously from the richness of other sets of metadata made available by other BRI institutions. We have also only adopted international standards for cataloging and publishing digital content to ensure interoperability and focused on the quality of data content, structure, and format. We consider digital resources as objects to preserve as much as the physical ones. 
We are paying particular attention, therefore, to instability and fragility of digital formats and the problem of sustainability. So, um, from one standard to another, as you can see from this slide, we are mapping metadata from Mark 21 to modes, which is the image in the center, according to a customized template. And then we associate the relevant digital object. Thanks to this meticulous work, we are able to process the migration of collections in batch processes. And this is the island or a backend of the Libya record examined in the slides above, where it is possible to see the various standards and formats on which the digital repository can be built. This is how a user will access the record you've seen before. Librarians and archivists are in a very good position to know what data are useful and the order in which they may be displayed. We have added the fields the users will find useful and we believe they will, but we are sure the needs may change over time and some data may be more appealing than others to researchers and broader audiences. Speaking of BRI records, we are sure we can build digital capacity through the exchange of information about best practices, cataloging and digitization. The few meetings we had with BIRI colleagues were very inspiring and we are convinced we will continue to learn a lot from sharing knowledge, experience and mistakes. We are building a community and a culture of mutual exchange where our aim is to help each other grow. For example, we have learned from the Society of Libyan Studies that it would be ideal to have a URI embedded into each record. This would be very useful in order to make our resources more findable. We have learned from Athens how complex the process can be for the digitization of a lantern slide collection in relation to their society for the promotion of Hellenic Studies image collection. This, this collection is the sister to our Society for the Promotion of Roman Studies, which is in the BSR Photographic Archive. We have learned from Ankara about the potential of linked open data and archaeological excavation data. Distributed amongst the BREs is a great deal of knowledge. Though we know that each institution's holdings are unique, and identity and diversity have to be preserved, we find that very often our resources complement one another and constitute a powerful body of knowledge for the history of British research in the Mediterranean. In this case, it is the overlapping relationships that represent real added value and make the whole more than the parts. Thank you very much. I'm handing over to Nurdan. Uh, thank you very much, organizers and John and Alessandra. Today I will give you brief information about uh, British Institute at Ankara and digital repository system. British Institute at Ankara supports, enables and encourages research in Turkey and the Black Sea region in a wide range of fields, including archaeology, ancient and modern history, heritage management, social sciences and contemporary issues in public policy and political sciences. Founded in 1947 and BIA was incorporated in the 1956 cultural agreement between the Republic of Turkey and the United Kingdom. BIA has archives and collections since 1947. BIA David French Library houses books, theses, maps, journals and audiovisual materials. It is recognized as the foremost library in its field in Ankara and one of the two best in Turkey. It is used by British, Turkish and other international scholars and students. Collections created during the research activities, especially archaeological excavation and surveys in Turkey. Pottery, squeeze, photographic, animal bone reference collection, botanical reference collection, including herbarium wood and charcoal specimens, archaeological documents and drawings, map collection, preserved physically, and they digitized 
since 2000. And uh, in 2006, they created a bespoke system. Now you can reach from our uh, website. I will send the link. Digitization activities done by different scholars and people between 2000 and 2018. At the end of 2018, Digital Repository Office set up and started to build a repository. First step was making an assessment of all our archives because some of them were digitized and had a database. This assessment helped us to understand our metadata schema and our controlled vocabularies. Then we need to choose the software for repository and library, but it was difficult to choose one system for library collections and the collection, uh, library and the collections. So we decided to use Koha, the open source system for library, and Islandora for uh, digital repository system. So it is open source, flexible, uh, and then also the British School of Rome were was using this system. So we are sharing our knowledge uh, in order to use this system better. Installation is completed, but configurations uh, for taxonomies are continuing. So we couldn't open our island or a system yet, but we are planning to open it in autumn. And also library system will be open soon. Open access is important in the digital cultural heritage institutions, especially for library, archive, and museums. BIA is, uh, has a, uh, institu is an institute working as a library, archive, and museums also is a research institute. So we, are, we need to deal with both the legacy data and the born digital data. Uh, the aim is to create open access repository. So we are trying to implement FAIR principles, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So we, our problem was, how are we going to open our digital data uh, uh, with, with this repository? So repository will have OIS mechanism to harvest data uh, and share data with other platforms. We choose qualified Dublin Core metadata schema because we had different type of materials in our collection. So we need to decide the identifiers for uh, for our collection and for digital data. We checked the DOI and handle, and we decided to use handle uh, for our collections. Now you can see our prefix. When we open our digital records, the, each record will have handle ID. Uh, also, when we do this uh, process, we, are, we checked our physical folders and changed with acid-free folders for physical preservation. In this time, we were checking our physical item IDs, ident uh, record IDs, and also adding those IDs into the digital system in order to make it findable for physical material. We also checked control vocabularies like Getty, Library of Congress, FAST, VIAF, and tried to adopt these into Islandora and link with our database. Uh, also, the important thing is the reusable uh, data. So we decided to use Creative Commons licenses for digital uh, items. As a research institute, we are also creating born digital data for our project. So we need to think about the data management plan for our dig born digital data. And uh, during some of the projects, we are starting to think about the, how to record and keep those data uh, during the project after an end of the project. Uh, we are, as, we, as I said, we are trying to use international vocabularies, but sometimes those are not fit in our cases. So we choose, uh, we try to create our vocabularies for creator, you know, person, and ancient settlements. In this slide, you see our names, John Garstang, Seton Lloyd, David French, and we find the authority links and uh, we have and Wikidata and Library of, Co Library of Congress. Uh, we started to work on this list and now we made a collaboration with Wikimedia UK and Turkey and now creating uh, Wikidata links and also providing data to Wikidata so other cultural institutions can use our um, data. 
Also, we made a collaboration with uh, Society of Libyan Studies, British School Rome, British School Athens, in order to key, uh, create linked open data for uh, all British schools. And so you will see our ancient settlements. The ancient settlements had a problematic way uh, in Turkey because the village names also changing in Turkey. So we are creating our ancient settlements list. Thanks to our scholar interns and volunteers for their time and effort because verification is manually and needs time and patience. We tried to do uh, automatic, but there was problems. In order to link our data, we are checking all related items and finding information in the collections. Collecting and verifying information are time consuming and sometimes need experienced people. In this case, we need to deal epigraphic data and it has different terminology and abbreviations. Archivists needs to work with epigraphs collaboratively to avoid mistakes. Now the aim is to link the data in the collection. So squeeze, as you see, we have a squeeze archive and then this as a photograph in our archives and it is published in this our book and it is also it has also transcription so you need to find all this data and link in the digital uh, repository system we are digitizing our herbarium collection and had a difficulty to choose the metadata and taxonomy Biocultural collections, especially flora, are using Darwin core metadata and flora taxonomy. So we need to configure our system to add proper vocabulary set. As you see, the GBIF has a taxonomy for flora, but still you need to work on flora of Turkey for your vocabulary. We need to think physical preservation in order to uh, physical preservation. We mount, uh, we are mounting specimens from newspaper to the acid-free papers and then taking photographs. At the same time, we need to think about the digital preservation. So uh, the photographer is taking photos in raw format and JPEG format. So we need to convert uh, raw files to TIFF for the digital preservation and also JPEG files for dissemination. Uh, as I said, VA is a library, archive and museum and a research institute. So we are dealing with both legacy data and born digital data at the same time. Also, both have challenges to organize, manage and preserve. Digitized data have different DPI and formats. Lack of standards and controlled vocabulary, vocabularies for some data needs additional effort. We cannot use the controlled vocabularies directly. We need to adapt and create our vocabularies and also each country has different regulations for archaeological or cultural heritage data. So we need to learn those policies before open our data to in digital platform. We need to learn archive, museum and excavation regulations for countries. Language is another difficulty for archival records. Transcribing handwritten documents needs time and effort. All digitized data and catalog information needs to mapping to proper metadata format. Data cleaning and verification are time consuming and needs archivists. Archaeologists and information managers need additional trainings and support, so they need to work together. We need to choose proper software and think about the storage and backup issues. Also the main uh, problem in the digital world, how are we going to preserve our digital files? Are we going to convert all digi digitized JPEG files to TIFF format? And for the projects, we are uh, trying to create our data management plan for born digital data. Each archive is unique and you need to work on it. Also, it is a long journey and not easy, but it has opportunities to learn more and find your own way. Archaeologists, archivists, researchers need to think about how to organize and preserve the digital data. Also, it is a teamwork. Cultural heritage institutions have limited funding. In order to save time and energy, we start to share our knowledge and experience with other bris. So it is good to work together and spend our time to create new things together. To increase visibility, we will share our information with national and international partners like Europeana and Wikimedia. We already made collaborations with several partners like Archaeology Data Service and Ariadne Plus. We also partner of CEDA, Saving European Digital Archaeology Data from Digital Dark 
page and translated the fair guidelines into Turkish. The aim is to find more ways to work with uh, to work collaboratively with national and international partners. Sharing knowledge and learning more is helpful because we all have limited times to do something. So that is fine. That is better to find collaborative ways. Uh, with the help of our team members, interns, volunteers, we are working to organize, manage, and preserve our archives and digital data. During the pandemic, we worked online for most of the time, and data creation and verification process also uh, done by online. Thanks to all of them and for you to listen to me. And now I would like to pass to Charlotte to talk about Society Libyan Studies. The, we're, we're speaking in, in, as you probably realized, in historical order. And the Libyan Society is the youngest of the organizations speaking today. Um, it fo only founded in 1969. And in many ways, uh, we're lucky because we can um, benefit from the experience of others. Like many things, it happened in a way by chance. It's the chance consequence of the fact that the British found themselves in charge of Libya after the, the Second World War. And there is extremely, if you go to the National Archives website, there's extremely interesting account from papers in the National Archives about the, pro, the initial response of the British Army when they find themselves among all these antiquities. Luckily, several of them were in fact archeologists. The initial idea was that whatever needed doing would be done under the guidance of the British School at Rome, which is a much larger institution, uh, but more and more activity as everywhere grew, archeological activity grew and grew. And so in 1969, a separate society was, was set up. As a consequence of this history, we don't have a fine building to show you. We, no, we don't have any land. We don't have a location in Libya or in London. Um, but we do have an immensely dynamic group of people all over the world who are interested in Libya and above all, very good friends in Libya, in the antiquities departments and in the universities. And in the way archeology, span arch, being an archivist is rather like being an archeologist in that you find things that you don't know, you don't choose what to find. You have whatever you have. And so there's an exotic accumulation of items that the Libyan society has, which is still growing and which is important because it records a past which even since the Second World War has been vanishing very fast. I'll run you very quickly through what you've seen. This is the Libyan society. This is a, a narrative of the history and the what we've ended up with is a collection of books which have been accumulated in various ways, but some of which are extremely valuable books from archaeological archeolo accounts which are not found anywhere else in England, and also a collection of archives of all kinds. As you all know, archives come in every shape and form. But in both cases, we don't have a, a specific home. We are the guests of the institutions which house the library at the School of Oriental and African Studies and the archives in Leicester. So it became increasingly clear that we needed to think about digitization, not least because we don't have a permanent home. And also because over the years, the threat to the heritage has increased. And while we all think of things like war, um, it's very interesting how rapidly simple weather can lead to the deterioration and loss of valuable antiquities um, all over the world. And, but to specific case of Libya, of course, was transformed in 2011. Um, and this 
meant that from 2011 onwards, it became extremely difficult for any of our archaeological colleagues to operate in country. And so the proper use of our resources seemed to us to be to pay more attention than we had to all these holdings which we had accumulated. And we started where you actually start, far behind the other three, we started with cataloging. So a very basic and primitive thing that we did first was to find a student who would create a, a, a Zotero catalog of the holdings in our, in our library. And that's an important first step of knowing what we have. And uh, publications like this one from 1926 are very rare. Um, then we turned to the archive. The archives had gradually accumulated and had ended up being held by the library of the Inst University of Leicester. When I say held by the library, they're physically in a different building, but they are, the library takes responsibility for them. And the library enabled us to f find an archivist. And we, so the first thing we had to do was have a professional archivist provide a professional catalog at the same time undertaking some conservation steps. That information went into the University of, Ca of, of Leicester's library catalog which isn't the easiest place to find it. And we then asked that with their help, we exported the material in XML to the digital laboratory at King's where we were already building, simultaneously building a gazetteer of locations in Libya. And so the collection catalog is now sitting within that framework in a Django uh, database and is therefore there to be built and developed and explored. You will see an entry here where one entry in the archive catalog is 594 photographs. So there's, this is simply the very first step towards the digitization and the addition of images to the online catalog. The, uh, the, the original catalog will still be the key finding mechanism for the, for the physical objects. So we're right at the beginning of what we want to do, need to do. We can't fund a total program of digitization and cataloging of everything. There's so much to do. We're very much hoping that students and scholars will be encouraged to come and work on these materials, developing research projects and undertaking cataloging and research and digitization as part of their own research projects. That would seem to be the most manageable way of working. And we're benefiting enormously from being part of the Biri family. We can learn from everyone. The most useful thing and learning what the mistakes are, of course, we're lucky to be turning up late in the day but as you saw in Rome, for example, they hold photographs taken in Libya in the 1940s. We can provide the meta, much of the metadata about the locations and the objects photographed. They can provide the image itself. What we produce together will be much better than anything we produce separately. And so, what we need now really is to evolve or to develop a system of interchange for the information held by all the different Biri. Uh, and I think that's a picture of us really, um, plugging our information in, in such a way that it can be identified by others. So that's what we're hoping to achieve. Over to Charles. Charlotte, thank you very much. But thanks you to all of you. I like the picture at the end. It's to remind people of the analog technology that uh, underpinned all this in the first place. But thank you very much, all of you, for giving such an extraordinary, rich and interesting picture of 
the activities that you're all undertaking, but also, of course, the, the links between you and the uh, openings and possibilities and lessons learned for the other Beeries too. And I hope for, uh, in many senses, in, in the hall as well. I think we have one uh, question but uh, from Alan Sudlow, who asked early on, about um, a standard identifier that allows people, digital items have a standard identifier to allow search across different collections. He thought it may have been answered, but I, if anybody wants to answer that, because it did strike me when you were talking about searchability, whether that would be something that would be uh, worth uh, saying something about or, or clarifying. Well, I can answer. Sure yeah, yeah. For the British Institute at Ankara, we are going to use handle instead of DOI. Uh, that there will be the persistent identifier for each uh, record. Uh, so we hope it will be much more sustainable in the future. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I suppose it, it, it does depend upon the, the, what you find the, the most convenient in some ways. There's another question that's just come up, which is, of course, not unexpected in this past year or so, which is, um, Curious to know how the pandemic has impacted on all your activities and whether it's influenced or steered recent uh, priorities. Uh, so it's to get a sense, and I think Nurdan mentioned this in relation to Ankara, but I think also Charlotte as well. So has it had a, a, a material, has it had a material effect upon the way in which you conduct things or reminded you that these are things that still need to be done? Charlotte. Yes, I think it helped us. I mean, in some ways, it came at the right moment for us because it helped us to focus our not enormous resources on this particular aspect. It suddenly brought into the foreground the importance, something which started, of course, with the Libyan war, that over the last 10 years, the importance of recording this material, preserving it, getting it out and putting it in a format where colleagues in Libya can have access has become increasingly evident. Yeah, Alessandra. Yes, can I also add that uh, the uh, lockdown and the pandemic has encouraged us to be more proactive in uh, with digital uh, digitization projects and uh, uh, has kind of uh, made us think more uh, about what to digitize, uh, what to what as uh, the priority. Uh, in terms of collections. And so it has been uh, a kind of catalyst. I, 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 I uh, maybe just pushed us to, to think more about digital collections and also has created this community between this discussion between BREs, which is was very positive and inspiring and really um, we hope to continue on this mm. um, road. I was going to ask a question actually, which uh, I think that um, Charlotte uh, mentioned about the Gazetteer reminded me is that if one's doing searchability across platforms and culture, you think about place names and how they've changed in mm. history and in languages. And how do you cope with that? I mean, if for instance, Turkey, which has gone through different languages, different empires, different uh, and, and different place names in some form or another. Do you have some way of dealing with that easily? Go down. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was the main problem for us because, I mean, we started to work on the gazetteers. We checked the gazetteers and some of the material uh, that is related to one settlement, we couldn't find that settlement in the known gazette there. So you need to work on and find the location and the coordinate for that site. So that was the difficult part. And now we are verifying all our data. It is approximately 2000 settlement, ancient settlement in our archive. Uh, related with the ancient settlements data. Also, which, which we are talking with Charlotte about the gazetteer. So we don't want to create gazetteer again, the, the tool, let's say, uh, but we have this data set. So we are trying to find out the uh, uh, ways so the other institutions, Libya or Rome or Athens cannot spend a lot of time to create the same data that came from Turkey. So that was the big uh, problems, but we are checking all 
uh, international gazetteers and find out the way. But sometimes you have to do it manually. So you need, you require mm. human resource to do it. So, but they are talking about some programming languages and we tried, but it didn't work well. So we are doing it manually, but we are hoping to share this data at least with uh, Wikidata in the first place. And after that, hope we can create a BIRI places information data set, let's say. I think also it's important just to bear in mind that it's, it's that this is not a situation just for standardization. In our archives, we have evidence about place names, which needs to be recorded and made visible. And the, there's this tension between trying to identify, oh, I wonder where this really is. And this is the place that this man referred to in this way. Um, I'm wondering in, in Libya, uh, you, there are publications which refer to Barbary because of course that's the Barbary coast. Well, that's a place. It's an, it, 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 you won't find it in a, modern, in a modern map, but it needs to be reflected in a gazetteer of places. And I think it's very important to balance the, uh, the locating of things with the recording of our specific data. There was a question from Jill, uh, using Koha with archival collections, do you have any top tips? In other words, uh, from your experience, I think Alessandra- you Yes, can... I think this is for me. And uh, yeah, uh, we are using Koha, which is a, um, a library software system to catalog uh, uh, photographs. So each single item has been cataloged uh, using Mark 21 as a format standard. And uh, of course, uh, we can also describe a collection of items uh, by using the Mark 21 uh, standard. But uh, for archival resources, I, as I said, we use archive space. So it's just a matter to understand how to migrate these resources from different systems and how to display them onto a digital asset management system, which is Islandora. But actually, we find we found out that uh, uh, Mark 21 is very granular, so allows for more detail um, when it comes to describing uh, the content of a picture and also create links, hopefully with the Libya um, gazetteer. And uh, and yeah, that's, I think I have answered this question. Thank you very much. There's another question from Neil Grindley. He said, uh, obviously, you've been talking about the benefits of collaboration and the way in which the Biris assist each other. Do you have any plans to more formally join up and share infrastructure, perhaps to address the challenge of digital preservation? There's a leading question. <laughs> but I don't know whether... I've always uh, hoped. Uh, it seems to me that that's absolutely the big question coming towards us. Uh, as in so many institutions, um, I've always hoped that our parents at the British Academy would like to open a lovely sustainability centre for us. But it is a job that it would be sensible to look at jointly. Mm. I have a feeling that the slide of the telephone exchange was geared to the British Academy, actually. <laughs> yeah, you've got it. <laughs> Spot on. But it's certainly true. I mean, given the fact that you are uh, sharing knowledge of how things are done, sharing different systems, Clearly, the question does come up in the end about how that can best be sustained uh, for, for the benefit of all, uh, both the, the four of you who are talking today, but also those, the other four who are, who are also beginning to find out about these things. Yeah. John, was it, was, were you going to mention something then? I, I wasn't sure you had your hand up. Uh, no, I was uh, back a couple of questions, it's fine. Okay, that's fine. Um, I, I mean, the other question, which I suppose is a typical one coming from the British Academy, which is that clearly all of you have had to rely on and been able to rely on some amazingly gifted teams of people, but teams don't come free. And so in a sense, there is a funding question, which I suppose is also something that's quite good to air in such a conference, which is, have you thought about yet applying to particular funds, foundations that might be sympathetic to this aspect of your work? and 
you, you might get some echoes from other people who are attending this conference as well. Oh, oh John. Yeah. We, well, I'll, I'll just say that um, the three-year postdoc that we re just received funding for starting in October has a particular aim to work with the George Finlay papers um, and included within that bit was uh, sufficient funds to do the physical digitization, but also a six month uh, project assistant who will work with our archivists to catalog those and properly provide the metadata. Uh, in other words, making them entirely useful while the, the, the postdoc will actually, as it were, cover the academic and draw out the significance of, of all of those. So, I mean, I think the, the, the crucial thing is that it's actually quite difficult to get funding just mm. to stick the things on the scanner. Yep. Um, it's better linked to a research question. But on the other hand, the big need is to get as much digitized as possible. And then, of course, you have the, the, the human resource aspect of, of uh, cataloging and making that available. Mm. Absolutely. Well, that's very encouraging. I think we should be bringing this session to an end, but I wanted to thank all of you really for such excellent presentations. I mean, uh, I think it's given all of us, even those who are quite aware of what the Beeries do, even more awareness of the richness of your collections and what you're undertaking at the moment, which is a quite challenging set of tasks. But what's really encouraging is I think the way you're all working together. And as you said, sharing your knowledge with other Beeries who are just embarking on this uh, area as well. And I like to think that um, presenting in such a conference, you will get some feedback from people who've had to face similar challenges than you have, which is to think about how do different collections speak to each other? How does that make it more accessible? But really.